20 seconds. Initiate final sequence. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Engage. So, my name's Stephanie Tompkins. I'm the director of a little organization called DARPA that stands for Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. I'm really thrilled to be here talking to you today. Uh, what I want to do is talk to you about what keeps me up at night. So when I talk to people about DARPA, it turns out most of them know, if they've ever heard of us at all, most of them know what we're famous for. Um, that would be things like uh, the internet, uh, stealth technology, um, maybe a little more obscure, but the actual creation of material science as an academic discipline from which things like semiconductors and alloys and things like that all sort of arose. So lots of really big things. Um, they're also super aware that um, the first word in DARPA is defense, right? So we work for the Department of Defense. We spend a lot of time thinking about national security. So when people ask me uh, what keeps me up at night, I'm pretty sure they're expecting one of two things. A huge military risk area, and, and there are certainly plenty of them, I think you've heard a number of them already today, um, or some really massive technological gap. Truthfully, what keeps me up at night the most is the fact that there are probably amazing national security ideas out there that we are just not hearing. Because the way DARPA works, our ideas are coming in at us and we are trying things from sort of a bottoms up process over and over and over again, missing the idea that is gonna change the world, that's terrifying. So, um, you know, one thing I know is that there are many, many communities out there uh, across the country, across this world, um, that have amazing ideas, extraordinary expertise, and an in-depth way at looking at problems that collectively, we at DARPA just might not be uh, um, aware of. And I should say, you know, so we understand there's some barriers to entry to that. I'm going to talk about that. But I, I think it's actually worth pointing out that this particular community and DARPA um, have quite a history of working together, um, probably more than most people realize. So uh, take the internet. I talked about DARPA in the internet. The truth is what DARPA actually did was we created something called uh, the ARPANET. And it's in no small part this community that helped graduate the ARPANET into the internet um, that we know and love or don't love on any given day um, uh, today. So the original ARPANET, uh, think about this. It was basically designed so that one specialized computer could talk to another specialized computer in a different part of the country. Uh, remember back then computers were the size of refrigerators or entire rooms and they cost a whole lot of money. So it didn't make a lot of sense to be redundant um, with everybody having the same capabilities. The original ARPANET was also really focused on being able to uh, be resistant to disruptions. Uh, and so that led to things like packet switching, so TCP IP, um, which was a huge radical change from the sort of circuit-based technology that were running communications back then. Think, uh, you know, basically telephone calls. Oh, and by the way, I should mention, the very first thing typed into the ARPANET was meant to be login. They got L, they got O, and then the system crashed. Just remember that, because I'm going to come back to that part later. Um, but no, so thinking about the transformation of the ARPANET into the internet, it was a lot of poking and prodding at strengths and weaknesses um, in the system, identification of vulnerabilities, coming up with uh, solutions, improvements, all of that from you know, communities like this one, but this one in particular, which ultimately led to um, the transformation into the internet and into something which I think most of us will agree, fundamentally changed how this wor our entire world works, um, lives, and communicates. Now that type of transformation is what DARPA is all about. We're focused on making really big bets um, on high risk, you know, new technologies, things that we think are fundamentally going to be revolutionary and disruptive and game changing, right? Those are all overused words, but they are words that we live and breathe and we actually mean them when we talk about that. So DARPA, it's not about making something 5% better or 10% better or even 50% better. It's about making it 5,000 times better 
or it's about saying the thing that we want to make better, we're just going to get rid of it all together and we're going to move to an entirely different solution space. Maybe we're going to create new problems, but we're essentially moving entirely out of the domain of the problem that might feel too hard to solve. Now, um, I should point out that sometimes the timing isn't right, or sometimes we were just wrong, or we failed. We set these massive audacious goals and we didn't meet them. The truth is that should happen a lot because if we're succeeding at all our goals, it means we are not doing our job um, and we are not taking the big risks, which is what we have actually been chartered to do. And for what it's worth, um, sometimes we learn a lot more from our failures or as much from our failures as we do from our successes. And so we celebrate our failures. Um, but when we do succeed, our belief is that those successes should be fundamentally changing the world. And one of the things I actually find amazing is when we look back on those things where we were successful is the movement from this is utterly impossible to, okay, maybe, but probably not, to, well, of course, it's inevitable. And how did we, we can't even imagine um, what life was like before. So I'll give you a few, um, a few additional examples. Uh, miniaturized uh, GPS. So every time you use a GPS-enabled device, that was DARPA. Uh, graphical user inter interfaces, DARPA. Uh, the mouse. Who knew the mouse would become so ubiquitous? Or maybe you don't use a mouse, but you use a touch screen. Both DARPA. Voice recognition, and Siri in particular, love it or hate it. We will uh, accept responsibility. Um, accelerometers, the wireless capabilities at the core of today's uh, smartphones and tablets. We kicked off the self-driving car industry, brain-machine interfaces. So um, those are the, the, all things that link back to major DARPA investments, and a lot of those are things that you have probably heard about. Um, what might be a little less well-known are the more recent interactions that we have had with this community in particular. So I'm going to ask for a show of hands. How many of you have used Nmap? OK, that's a lot of hands. Right. So DARPA was actually instrumental there, um, exploring ways to map and learn from an environment containing 4 billion IP addresses to one of 340 trillion, so IPv4 to IPv6. How about HackRF? Right? OK, so the creation of a $340 transmit and receive software-defined radio, uh, completely lowering the barrier to entry for hackers and being really transformative in how we interact um, with Spectrum. Um, how about onion routing, uh, the underpinnings of Tor? Onion routing was developed actually by the Navy, but as part of a DARPA program. And the team then decided to release that, te that technology open source. Um, it's now used by millions of people every day, uh, helping to give people a voice all around the world. Or how about that uh, car hacking, the one that made the news a few years back? Or maybe more than a few years back. I'm, I'm feeling my age. Uh, but remember when Charlie Miller and Chris Balachik demonstrated they could remotely hack a car while the reporter was still inside? Yeah, that was DARPA, and that freaked a lot of people out. And now automobile companies have entire teams dedicated to worrying about things like that. Now, if you actually just look at DEF CON alone, between 2011 and 20, 2014, about 10% of all of the talks can be traced back to just one DARPA program, Cyber Fast Track, what we call CFT. So I think it's no surprise when you hear that history to think that we believe we absolutely need to continue to work with you um, and hear from you. It's why I'm here. So uh, I'm going to go back to those very first couple of letters typed into the internet, right? So L O crash. Um, it was a memory corruption. Same old software defect that we have been repeatedly living with. Um, why are so many of the security vulnerabilities still found around today? Um, really just variations on the same theme, themes. Uh, I mean, code and data corruption, buffer overflows and mem memory manipulation, command inter interjections when uh, user input is treated as a command um, instead of information. And even though many exploits are exquisitely written, they're still ultimately taking class uh, advantage of the very same classes of software defects that we've been living um, with forever. So what if uh, all of the classes of security vulnerabilities um, or maybe we can appropriately just call them software defects. What if they all just disappeared tomorrow? You could suggest that that is a DARPA question, and it is one that we are working on and we would love more help in. But the question I wanna ask you is let's imagine that that happens. 
what's next? Because that's really the DARPA question. The adversary doesn't just pack up their bags and quit. Um, we will always have a mission to complete. So maybe you are the ones with the magic idea um, about how we can make all the cyber vulnerabilities disappear overnight. But maybe you have also imagined the problem we would face when all of them go away. Um, and th the bottom line is, I mean it when I say that I'm really worried about what you might be imagining, because if we're not hearing about that, we are completely missing out on being able to really make those big bets and hopefully change the world. So we want you to have the opportunity um, to solve really big problems. We want you to be able to share your seemingly crazy ideas, things that others have missed, maybe because you're a seer, uh, maybe because you can identify a problem that no one else can, you know it intimately, and you can actually envision some thread of, a, of, a, of an actual solution. So when you have a problem that's hugely important to you, something that you probably had to duct tape and work around forever to the point that you almost forget that it's there, um, but you have a glimmer of an idea on how to fix it, um, there's, a, there's a pretty good chance that that idea um, should be important to us and we need to hear from you. We know that you're likely the best people to both identify and to help solve the problem and we want to enable you. Okay, so if you've ever tried to work with the government before, um, I recognize that that's not always really easy. And we're easier than most, but still not necessarily trivial. Um, so we spend a lot of our time trying to figure out how to lower those barriers to entry, and we do a lot of experimentation, not just in science and technology, but in business. So we've demonstrated before um, that we can make these barriers go away. Um, and the, you know, I mentioned the Cyber Fast Track or CFT program. Uh, who here remembers CFT? Okay. A few people, but actually, for those that don't, let me point out. So it was a two-year experiment. During that time, we had about 500 proposals come from people in this community, 130 of which were accepted and funded. The program manager is someone a lot of you um, know or at least have heard of, Mudge. Um, he turned around decisions on those proposals within 24 hours, and within a week, we had funds um, at the teams in order to actually start working immediately. Mudge also um, acted as an ambassador, and he made sure that the government respected the culture of the community um, and that there was full transparency. After CFT um, opened the doors to innovative partnerships like this, DARPA actually continued to engage, and so um, a number of years ago now we had uh, the Cyber Grand Challenge, also at DEF CON, and this week we are doing the semifinals of the AI Cyber Challenge, AICC. And additionally, a lot more people from this community um, have come to DARPA or been, been working um, behind the scenes with DARPA. Um, so all of them have really helped shape our ideas and, and in a lot of ways fundamentally shape what DARPA is and how we go about doing our mission in a, in a way that we wouldn't have recognized maybe 10 or 15 years ago. So uh, we've proved that it's possible for the government, or at least DARPA, um, to move faster than the commercial sector uh, and to, and to while still taking those really big, bold, transformative risks um, that are part of our mission. So we have continued that tradition of experimentation, lots and lots more business experimentation, a lot of different ways to interact much more quickly and much more easily. Um, in some ways, maybe so many different ways that that in itself has become kind of an interesting conundrum to sort of figure out what the easiest path is. So um, we have an organization called DARPA Connect, and if anybody is struggling with working with DARPA or you're not quite sure where to start, um, all you have to do is, you know, search for DARPA Connect. Think of it as a one-stop help desk. Like, how do I find a program manager at DARPA? How do I read one of their... Their, their, their documents or our calls for proposal, which we try to write as simply as possible, but which are always burdened with a whole lot of sort of official terms and conditions that you might be a little worried about. Uh, DARPA Connect is there to help. They, they're gonna provide custom coaching to help with just about any aspect of engaging with us or with other parts of the Defense Department. Because you know if it's not us, there's a good chance that what you're talking about should be heard by somebody um, somebody else. You know, we've also got some experiments going on in how to very rapidly get people with great ideas um, intersecting into the classified problem space because we have a chicken and egg problem there where defining the problem and, and finding the solutions keep going past each other because you sort of have to already have one in order to have the other. Um, so, you know, the bottom line is you absolutely don't have to be a major defense contractor to work with us. 
uh, at least 30% of our budget goes to small, uh, to small businesses and non-traditional organizations. Um, another 20% goes to universities. We really tend to have the, the fundamental thing that we look for is the idea. And we wanna make sure that we can hear that idea as quickly as possible. So I know we still have a lot to learn. The world is changing rapidly, um, but I think we're moving in the right direction there. And if we're not, I, I wanna hear from you as to what we can be doing better. Uh, okay, so you, I, I say over and over again that uh, we wanna hear your ideas. Who is this we, right? We um, at DARPA, when I say that, that means our program managers. DARPA is made up at any moment in time of about 100 program managers. They come to us from all walks of life, from this community from companies, from other parts of the government, from universities, from many, many different technological sectors. And they come to DARPA because they think they can change the world. And um, that's a pretty deeply uncomfortable state to be in. I mean, it's a lot of responsibility. And one of the things we find works best at DARPA is that right around the time you start feeling comfortable, we kick you out. Uh, we have a constant cycle um, of new ideas and new people. And so that itself can be a little intimidating. You wanna to talk to a program manager, but they're, co they're constantly cycling in. That's where DARPA Connect can help. Um, find the program manager, tell them about your idea, think about you know, what keeps you up at night, what keeps them up at night, and look for those opportunities um, where we can then make a major investment and do something really transformative together. Um, so when you reach out to a program manager, all you have to worry about is the problem that you care about. Let us worry about connecting it to the bigger national security questions or to the rest of the government. Um, don't, don't ask them to tell you what to do, right? I mean, seriously, I can't imagine that most of you would, but it does happen. You tell them um, where you think these missing opportunities and, um, and problems might be. And we really can't wait to hear from you. Okay, so understandably, I'm really passionate about talking about DARPA. I could probably do it all day, um, but let's just leave it that that DARPA is pretty awesome, but um, we are simply the original ARPA. There are actually um, quite a number of extraordinary organizations that have been arising around the country um, and around the world that follow a very similar model. And the ecosystem is expanding. Um, so I'm really excited that I'm gonna be joined here on stage for a little fireside chat by the inaugural director of one of my very favorite ARPAs, ARPA H, ARPA for Health. We all care about health, so I think you're likely to be uh, I'm interested in what she has to say. And also, uh, I will be joined by Mudge, who has very recently returned to DARPA as our Chief Information Officer. So, welcome Renee and Mudge. Yeah. All right, are these? I think it's on. No, no, yep, oh, there we go, okay. All right, so it turns out, you know, we all know each other and we've talked to each other, you know, kind of in uh, these kind of bilateral conversations. We've never had a chance for the three of us to chat and it turns out we have questions. Um, so we're hoping you sort of enjoy sitting in. We, we are dying to learn a few things from each other. Um, and I am gonna kick off with uh, something that I am sort of embarrassed that I don't really know much. Like, we were actually program managers um, at the same time. I have no idea what made you take that jump to actually come work for DARPA. I, I, I just want to have a... Anybody here? You wanna use mine? Yeah, sure. We'll just swap like that, thanks. It's, it's the sharing amongst agencies already. Tech transition in, in progress, right in front of your very eyes. Um, well, that's, an, that's an interesting one. I thought you were gonna ask why I, I decided to rejoin. <laughs> but but um, the, uh, the joining- You, you the, rejoined in, because we like overwhelmed you. <laughs> we des were desperate to have you back. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. But yeah, but the first jump and the first- Yeah, the, the, yeah. The, the first one was, um, well, I mean, I had been working in technology. I was doing the loft, um, you know, I had been around folks uh, who were interacting with DARPA. There was a good academic and hacker community and program managers that we kind of knew. And um, I was also in, uh, I ended up in a government uh, contracting uh, organization. Uh, I won't uh, name them. And I was looking at things saying, 
you know, we can, we can do better. Uh, I'm seeing the same ideas coming in over and over again. And some of them I'm seeing are from this community, but not being presented by this community and not being performed by this community. And wouldn't they be the best to do the work because they know the problem, you know, most intimately. Um, and I also wanted to be an ambassador. Uh, I had done this throughout the loft. Uh, the first Senate testimony. Um, we won't talk about uh, many of the others. <laughs> um, and uh, it was a bi-directional one you know, because I had a good relationship with people in the government where I was like, oh, I see rays of light. I was, you know, I'm, I'm critical of a lot of uh, the government, but I also, you know, want to uh, give kudos and encourage where I see positive actions going. Um, and then I also wanted to make sure that this community wasn't viewed as just like a resource to pull from, um, but that this community, that we should be a resource to this community as well. Um, what I fell in love with was the fixed term. Uh, the fact that it was like you were fired as soon as you were hired because you're only there for four years uh, at most. So you better sprint. And the things you're dealing with are of such magnitude. And if you stop sprinting, you know, you'll have wasted your time. You'll have missed an opportunity to potentially have changed the world for the better. Um, or you'll have missed the opportunity to take a big chance at an agency that's much more, you know, risk tolerant and acceptant uh, so that, you know, it's okay to fail. We're going to learn from the failure. So you know, that combination was just like, okay, I, I, I can't pass this up. Let's give this a try. So that was a huge honor then. And it's a huge honor to rejoin. Um, I wrote a bunch of these down because so many people sent me in questions uh, and, and I wanted to make sure we we uh, caught some of these. So uh, I'm not the only one who was at DARPA. You were at DARPA also. You were at another uh, ARPA that uh, I have uh, relationships with as well. Um, two questions. I'll ask them one at a time. What's What do you view as the delta or the differences between ARPA-H and DARPA? Oh, right. Yeah, pass it. We'll pass it back. Um, so I, I love hearing your origin story to becoming a program manager. And uh, I, I do think that's where a lot of the similarities lie. So when I became a program manager, it was also the same sense of urgency to solve a problem and not having an outlet for it. And so uh, what brought me to DARPA was was really around genome editing technologies. And this is dating myself here over a decade ago, where these were brand new technologies um, that had a lot of off-target effects and unexpected consequences. Um, and that was the first time I came to DEF CON, actually, was to engage with this community, thinking about DNA as a programming language and what are other ways that you can be um, preventing misuse, but creating tools to make sure we can get this into the real world. And so giving this back to the people is, is, is such an important part, I think, of what ARPAs do. And so when there was an opportunity to come back to government and, and lead and launch the first ARPA for Health um, with that spirit of adopting that you know, DARPA bravado, but taking that model and really pursuing our mission, which is to accelerate better health outcomes for everyone. So we stole directly the first eight Heilmeyer questions from DARPA. So this is, you know, what's the problem you're trying to solve? How's it done today? What's new in your approach? And then some tactics around, you know, cost, um, how long will it take and what are your milestones? We've added a few questions um, at ARPA-H. So this is one of the differentiators. It's so important in healthcare that we are creating tools that are cost effective, that people can actually afford, and, and that they are accessible to communities, whether it's urban, rural, regardless of your demographics, but then having a customer experience in mind. And so our program managers can't launch a program unless they've thought about who's the end user. As a patient, we've all had negative experiences with the healthcare sector. And so how would you redesign with a human-centered approach that entire process? Or as a doctor, um, you know, what I've learned that the OR is sacred. And if you're gonna introduce something into the operating room, you need that doctor as a partner um, developing those capabilities with you. And so um, we're really trying by design to build that into a lot of what we're doing um, at ARPA-H. And, you know, Stephanie said that we had, you, you all have about 100 program managers. We're at about 20. Uh, we're still growing. So uh, that's also an open call to think about what are some of those big problems in health um, at the intersection of uh, some of the cyber and, and data capabilities is certainly an area that we really want to grow out. I'll steal it back for that. I don't know where we're getting the, the Hummer feedback from. So the second one is, I understand 
the connection on like the biohacking village. I understand the weird machines, uh, uh, Emmanuel Lafroy and, and Sergey Bradis et al. Um, and, and that relationship, but this is normally a predominantly cyber uh, conference. So ARPA H and cyber, can you give me a little elaboration there? Yeah, so, you know, when, when coming back to our mission to accelerate better health outcomes for everyone, people really associate health outcomes typically with diagnostics or therapeutics, but actually a hospital shutting down and uh, because of a ransomware attack or whatever vulnerability uh, may be exploited actually immediately impacts patient outcomes as well. And so if we're being true to our mission, we are really um, leaning into the, the cyber capability as well. Um, but this is an area where healthcare does not have a lot of strengths. We don't have the workforce that a national security workforce has. Um, so we hired a program manager uh, back a little over a year ago, Andrew Carney, um, who had been really thinking about programs that, that he can be moving into in this space. Um, and so when Stephanie called me this spring to tell me about the AI uh, CC challenge, um, it was just such a great opportunity to play to both agencies' strengths um, the ability of a DARPA to launch a grand challenge for our agency to learn, but also operate at that intersection. Um, and really, Stephanie, it, you know, I learned so much in that call about the challenge, um, where it's been and where it's going. And I think it'd be fun if you wanted to share some of that with the audience today. Oh, sure. Yeah, so the AI Cyber Challenge is, is even for DARPA, it's been moving really, really fast. So I should point out, like DARPA starts 40 or 50 new DARPA programs a year. Obviously, a lot of them don't succeed. Um, we were looking for those really major breakthroughs. But typically our programs are around, you know, we lay out a hypothesis, we lay out, lay out a goal, we call for proposals, and then we fund people with the coolest and craziest ideas. But sometimes problems are, are they just don't lend themselves to that structure. Sometimes we need to issue a global challenge. Um, and we wanna have teams from all over the country like working in so many different ways, like we don't want to over-specify the solution space. Um, the first time we did that was something called the, the DARPA Grand Challenge. You remember I mentioned um, our role in the, uh, on the uh, self-driving car industry. The DARPA Grand Challenge was all about self-driving cars, and it was a race. And we spent a lot of time worrying about like the finish line and how to score, like who was gonna, how do we know who actually won? It turns out in that first year, not a single car made it across the finish line. And some of them were on fire, they rolled over, all kinds of crazy stuff happened. So when I say we embrace failure, we do, we do embrace failure. Because um, we went back out the next year and we did it again. Um, and, and that challenge idea is sometimes the right way to structure certain, certain questions. And the AI CC, the AI cyber challenge, kind of grew around the, the confluence of a couple of different questions. Um, one was, you know, we were, we were, like everybody else, we were looking at this wave of large language models um, and, and dominating the conversation. And a lot of the conversation was like all of the terrible things that could happen. And so part of what we wanted to ask is the classic contrarian question. It's like, how do you harness them in ways that we have some confidence in the outcomes for good? And what can we do as quickly as possible? Because we also want to learn. Um, we were having some conversations with people about fundamental national security vulnerabilities. And one was actually a conversation with Ann Neuberger, who was just up here about infrastructure and all of the software vulnerabilities there. So now here's another thing about DARPA. We do not tell our program managers what programs to run. We hire them and they come and tell us what needs to happen. What I can do sometimes is throw out into the atmosphere of DARPA a question and say, if anyone has ideas, this could be really important. And so we threw this question out there, large language models, national infrastructure, lots of looming national security questions. Um, and one of our program managers, Perry Adams, came in like within a couple of weeks and she's like, like I, I got an idea, but we need to do a challenge. We need to do this thing where we're actually looking at harnessing the large language models and finding and repairing vulnerabilities in national, national infrastructure as quickly as possible. Um, okay. Maybe unsurprising given the level of talent among our program managers. Um, less than a year after she, so, so actually a couple months after she had the idea, she was here at DEF CON announcing the kickoff. So that was one year ago. And then not too many months after that, she got, got pulled in by other parts of the national security community, sort of by name. She needed, she was needed for a bigger mission. So we had to find someone else equally amazing. And that was Andrew Carney. And then I, and he, but he worked for an A. 
Um, so we said, is it is it actually like against the law for us to share an amazing program manager? And the more we talked about it, the more we talked about the fact that the infrastructure question is one that hits almost every community from one direction or another. So Renee talked about the healthcare side of it. And we have also been talking to our counterparts at ARPA for Energy about the power grid or ARPA for, for infrastructure within the Department of Transportation. I feel like I'm at a Cuban embassy. That's Bad joke. <laughs> okay, we can all still breathe. This is good. Uh, so anyway, we so the, so the AI Cyber Challenge. So Andrew took over. He's been awesome. Um, the the semifinals are are sort of underway at this moment. We've had some amazing teams. I, I suspect some of you were out here in the audience. Thank you uh, for for putting your all. Into, uh, into that challenge, and, and I have no idea where the results are. I am dying uh, to see, and we're really looking forward to, to hearing that. But that's the, that's the AICC story. Um, and uh, I think that's the, does that cover what you're, you're looking for? I think, so. I think it's yeah. sort of why this community, I think that's kind of obvious, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So um, that actually, you know, we've talked about many, many intersections of this community um, and the ARPAs. Uh, and, and I think maybe one of the people who can best answer my next question, you know, Mudge, is you. What advice would you give uh, to members of this community on working with organizations like ours? Um, so I, I, you know, I don't know how many of you out there uh, remember the loft. Uh, I know that most of the really technical folks are over at HD Moore's SSH <laughs> talk right now. But when I was running the loft, which was this very early, what we like to call ourselves hacker think tank. Um, uh, but that was the Senate testimony of shutting the internet down in 30 minutes using BGP attacks. Um, was we had all of these ideas and solutions and thought they were really critical, but we looked at places to like figure out we only needed a small amount of funding, you know, in order to do this, and there were too many barriers to do it. Um, and that was again back towards the question of why did I join DARPA's. I wanted to remove some of those barriers. And actually, a lot of the barriers weren't as big as I thought. Um, and so the advice that I could give to anybody who wants to work on a problem is, first off, don't try and go in and solve like a government problem. Bring a problem that you're passionate about in your community. And it's not just your idea that you know we're looking for. You're probably the one that's been obsessing about it, knows the most nuances about it, have thought about it the most, that you've probably got one of the better shots at the solution, and you're probably one of the, you know, the best op you know, options to actually perform on it. So how do you, you know, cross that chasm? You know, the first one is um, the PMs. So, as Stephanie mentioned, we don't tell the PMs what to do. You know, they come in with a general idea or a bunch of ideas. Call them up. They're on the web page. You know, they're public servants. We're all public servants up here. Get 30 minutes or 60 minutes of their time if they if they can through the through one of their uh, assistants or schedulers. Uh, and don't ask. You know, tell them. Here's the thing that's been driving me nuts. That's been eating our lunch in our community for so long. Here's you know how I quantify why this is just like bleeding us dry, and the solutions in place aren't going to converge. Um, and here's you know here's my crazy idea with some data points showing that now it, and with the you know current technology, you know might be the right time to do it. Um, and then the other one is when you go to those what they're called broad agency announcements, the BAAs, what uh, Stephanie was referencing, which you know it's a few pages of what you know maybe somebody's looking for uh, and then like a whole bunch of government ease um, you know you can you can look through those find those five pages use connect um, and it's not as difficult as possible if it is difficult or are some of the new ways we've lifted from what we learned from CFT from what we've learned from RFT the different fast tracks and everything and you're still getting stuck uh, somewhere because 
you can't fly across country to go to an industry day, or there's not an announcement from a PM that's directly in line with your idea. That doesn't matter. Tell us where you get stuck. Tell us what barrier it is, how far you went. Tell us some ideas on how to remove it, because we actually have more um, uh, ability and just might not know that that's a barrier precluding a lot of people from participating uh, and, and playing. Um, and then the last part is, if it's not already some like, oh, here's an announcement of a program that came out uh, and my thing doesn't really fit in it, call the PMs anyway. There are these things called office BAAs, which are for a whole bunch of other ideas. And when you're talking to the PM, the PMs aren't allowed to say like, oh yes, you know, this is what I want, or yes, I will fund your idea or anything. The, everything has to be very equal, very open, very fair. But you can listen for some words that might give you a hint that they're interested, such as, you know, if you wanted to, you know, spend some time and propose or write up something, I'd be interested, you know, I'd, I'd have the interest to read that and consider it, you know, and look at it. So, you know, if you hear something like that, that probably means you have an aligned PM and, you know, go for it. If you hear somebody saying like, that doesn't really fit in with what I'm doing, you know, then maybe, you know, you can, you know, look for the next PM or look for the next area. So there aren't as many barriers as possible. We're trying to remove as many, make use of the PMs, call, tell us where we can do better and make sure it's solving something that matters to you and gives back to your community and your interest. We'll figure out if it's something that the DOD has also, they will have that problem also, even if they don't know about it. And that's where DARPA comes into play. But we should be a resource uh, to the community and you know, any parts of the government shouldn't be, in my personal opinion, going around and just take, 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 this looks like a neat community, take, 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 you know, what ideas do you have for us? It should be bi-directional and it should be in the areas that are naturally aligned, neither group trying to change the other into, you know, a mold of what it expects it to be. Stay who you are. I don't want you to change. I want you to keep growing in the direction that you're already growing. And the same way, you know, I, you know, there are plenty of ways for the government to change, but that's not the game that we're playing right here. You know, I, I think you, Mudge, you really highlight a lot of the roles that a PM has and finding that PM champion is, is such a, a key part of, I think, being successful at an ARPA. Um, but one of the roles of a PM is, is often to coach the community, I've learned over time. So how should you be thinking about the problem? Um, at ARPA-H, a lot of people don't know what even DARPA is in, in the healthcare sector. So it's having folks think about what does that future look like 10, 15 years from now? And, and how should you be thinking about that problem? For, for us, we don't have the Department of Defense as our ultimate second buyer. We are, we are almost exclusively reliant on industry. So we have, a, we have a different challenge at ARPA-H where we have to help industry think about where we should be going. And so from your perspective, um, where should, how should industry be thinking about cyber in, in general? Where are we going and, and how should they be thinking about the path that we're on? So, and I'm going to have a similar one uh, back to you. For industry, I think industry, you know, this is going to be Mudge and this is going to be the whole like, well, this is why we hired him. We knew he'd, he'd go off the rails at some point. Um, I think the industry is perfectly happy in this perverse steady state situation where we are because, you know, the, the vulnerabilities, we keep riding vulnerabilities faster than we can fix them. It's not so much that the adversary has gotten so amazing. It's that, you know, like, wow, well, we're producing software more and more rapidly with the same classes of vulnerabilities over and over and over again. So there's not an incentive structure really in place for them to, you know, go change something if they're not the one owning the cost of fixing it. That's us, the customers or the end users. But it is some place where like if DARPA went in and magically made everything go away, you know, I'd be fascinated to say like, okay, hey, why are we throwing all those crashes that we can't turn into RCEs and our fuzzing on the ground? It could be that they're actually even more valuable than remote code. Because if a system turns off at just the right time and can turn back on without leaving permanent damage, isn't that kind of one of like the, 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 the dreams of cyber? that like, you know, you look at look at a drone. I don't care about taking over the drone. I just would rather it not drop something bad on me right now. So let's turn that thing off. Or, um, you know, if I wanted to 
look at all of the software as a service. Look at all of AWS or GCE or anything else. It's a systems of systems of systems with wild layers of redundancy in different ways. And upsetting one part of the system causes it to reroute and change in different ways that might be invisible to the end user, but might be very advantageous to either a defender or an attacker. So it's this, what is the larger system? Is it side channels? Is it the fact that it moves into a different realm? Are you looking at it from like two layers higher than you ever thought of before? Or are you looking at it three layers lower because your phone has like 35 different CPUs and operating systems and shells inside of it, et cetera. So what happens if you know, the, the adversary gets a turn and uh, why don't we figure out that turn first and like, you know, let's box them in. <laughs> So um, my, my final question um, to the two of you uh, is you're both in charge of agencies with really broad uh, mandates, uh, well, I'll just say broad areas of interest and, 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 and execution and challenges. Um, two, two, part, two parts to this question. One, even how broad they are, What's something further outside of that realm that you're like, this is relevant and we should probably be considering that this might be within our domain? And then two, if it was just you, Stephanie or Renee, well, I get to call her Stephanie as opposed to, you know, Dyro or Dr. Tompkins. <laughs> I'm gonna beat that out of you at some point. Oh yeah, 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 no. Um, uh, is, uh, what is it you personally if there were no boundaries, is something that you're just like, I would love to entertain or go after this particular, you know, bizarre problem that nobody else seems to see, but I see it coming around the corner. Can you go first? Okay. Um, so maybe back to, to where we started on DNA as a programming language. So if, if we look 10 or 15 years from now, it, we don't have a program on this. I would love to find somebody excited about this. But, you know, thinking about large language models, um, every gene has a beginning, a middle, and an end. There's context to those sentences. There's predictions we can do. And we don't have a lot of uh, control of that biological domain. We're through gene editing, uh, through other genetic therapies, we're just starting to do, create the tools that, that we can control and manipulate genes. We can measure genes at scale and to do so in a cost-effective manner. Um, but how are we thinking about predicting that? Obviously for good, but at the same time, you know, preventing malicious use of those technologies. Um, and I, I am so excited. We have some little investments at ARPH looking at this now. Uh, we have a program called Apex that's focused on using generative AI to create you know, new to this earth uh, sequences that could be antigens to take all the other viruses that we don't yet have vaccines for off the table or to create, you know, new sequences to make new medicines and diagnostics. And so I'm, I'm really excited to unlock that uh, moving forward. But I'd love to hear what you are focused on, Stephanie. Well, I mean, I'll take the bait. I'll ask your second question first. I mean, if it was just me, I would be working on supply chain challenges. By training, I'm actually a geologist. I know where the raw materials come from. I know where they don't come from. And I know all of the vulnerabilities in that really complex system that the world depends on. Um, but you know what? There's a whole point about DARPA and ARPA is, is it actually like what I think is really exciting isn't that important. It's what our program managers tell us. It's what the communities are telling us. Um, an example of one that I'm particularly fascinated right now actually has to do with the future of quantum computing. It is still pretty much on the knife's edge as to whether this is going to be one of the most transformative things for humanity ever or utterly useless. <laughs> and while lots of people are working on quantum computing, not a lot of people are asking those hard questions as to how we will actually know which side of the fence the technology is going to fall. So we're really trying to address that kind of question. And the bottom line is that there is no shortage of massively hard problems to solve and amazing technological opportunities. So I'm very good, cleverly going to bring this back to our original point, which is the ideas are going to come from people like you. And um, we really hope that you aren't shy about telling us what you think um, they are, so. And how to solve them. Exactly. Yeah, with your yeah. ideas and you as the performer, hopefully. Not bad, huh? Yeah. All right. 32 seconds to spare. So <laughs> thank you again Thanks for all. your time thank and you. your attention. Thanks, everybody. Yeah.